But let's have a look now on how the foreign exchange markets are feeling about sterling. And uh, with us to help us do that is Credit Agricole. Uh, Dara, Mark, Dara, great to see you. Okay, let's first of all start off with, you know, we've got a mountain of bad news out there, but this sterling slide started off when we had some good news, and that was our revision to GDP. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like one of the peculiar things for sterling. Everybody loves to hate what it, it feels, and obviously, you know, you mentioned that earlier report, the kind of factors people have, have dwelt upon, but, you know, the reality is we've had a fourth quarter print in GDP that has outstripped the Eurozone. We're still drawing down inventories in the UK, so we've got a good scope for production picking up and of course we had that PMI yesterday which was a uh, held held firm and, and the export component obviously a function partly of that sterling weakness is, was incredibly strong so you know to my mind we are obviously focusing on the negatives but I think it, it's a bit too simplistic really just to say oh you know therefore sterling's heading to parity yeah that could be one thing but what about uh, this notion here of well not just the overall debt burden that the country has, but some of the more immediate factors which perhaps precipitated this fall. And I'm talking about outflows, M&A, and chiefly yeah. $35 billion, the prudential paying for AIA in Asia. Yeah, I mean, I think, to be honest, that was far more pertinent to yesterday's move than, you know, the fiscal story or the hung parliament. These opinion polls have been pointing towards a hung parliament for quite some time. Um, in terms of the M&A flow, what you typically find, though, is, is that the, the potency in terms of its impact on, on the currency market is felt pretty much on day one, when we have the announcement and everybody begins positioning uh, for the future flow. So I think that's a, a factor that will diminish uh, in importance in, in the days going forward. Dara, let's also just talk about the election. It is something which, of course, markets are getting very jittery about as uh, yeah. the Conservatives uh, find that their lead is being eroded by Labour. Uh, what happens in June, okay, in May or whenever the election is called? Well, how will a hung parliament actually really affect things? And if we had a definitive win either side, walk us through that. Well, I think if we end up, first of all, in the hung parliament situation, obviously the fear in the markets is that we, we get a kind of a, a policy uh, in action, and particularly on the fiscal front. I think the reality might be something different. You know, each of the parties agrees something needs to be done on the fiscal side. They, they can debate the nuances, but I suspect whoever uh, gets the minority government position uh, will get something through on the fiscal side that will keep the ratings agencies happy and, by extension, uh, keep the markets happy. So I think we're slightly overplaying uh, that story. I think, obviously, we, we, the uncertainty we sell sterling in the run-up to the election, but thereafter, I think sterling may rally. Uh, if, we, of course, we get a, a definitive winner, then it's a very bullish signal. But I, I have to say the opinion polls aren't pointing that way at the moment. Uh, let's just uh, move to, well, the whole idea of what happens with the British economy as well. If we see uh, the pound get weaker, then it, of course, means that we could have import inflation. That, in turn, could mean this cycle of putting up interest rates as well. Yeah, I mean, I suspect, to be honest, that we, we've, you know, Bank of England does fret about the, 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 the impact of, of sterling on import inflation, but uh, to their mind at the moment, uh, they see inflation falling very quickly. So I don't think it's a, an immediate preoccupation. If anything, they've been, I think, trying to talk sterling down in order to give that uh, boost to the economy, that uh, export competitiveness, and maybe just give a little bit of reflation, you know, um, if, they see, if they see inflation as not being a problem. So I don't think it necessarily points towards a, a swifter pace of interest rate rises, other than perhaps it delivering a little bit of support to the export sector and therefore overall economic strength. Well, one country which did raise interest rates, and that was Australia yeah. this morning, the Reserve Bank there doing that. Well, the reaction, walk us through what the reaction was. It went up the dollar and then the Australian dollar and then fell back. Yeah, I mean, I think the market was pretty divided. I, I saw in your own Bloomberg survey, it seemed pretty evenly split as, as to what the outcome might be. So when we did get the hike, um, you get that kind of knee jerk, oh, we should buy, they've raised interest rates. And then I think a more sober assessment is, well, frankly, if they hadn't moved last night, they would have most likely moved in a month's time. So you know, does it change really the complexion of the currency and the economy in a lasting way? I think the answer is no. So I think that explains the psychology of the market. But, but I think what's significant for the Aussie is that obviously it is a vote of confidence in the economy. It suggests they're not too terrified about the Chinese tightening that we're seeing. And, and therefore, in a way, I think, you know, medium term is still quite a bullish signal for the Aussie. Dara, great to see you as ever. Dara Mar there joining Thank us you. on Credit Agri-Cold CIB.